We're in a context here in 1 Corinthians. It's vitally important for us to grasp, and God gives three entire chapters uh, in this book to, uh, uh, to this matter of spiritual gifts. And he starts it in chapter 12, where he talks about the diversity of the spiritual gifts that existed in the early church. And then you get to chapter 13, and in chapter 13 he talks about the fact that not only, chapter 12, those gifts existed, chapter 13 says those gifts were going to expire. Uh, they were not intended to last uh, for the duration of the church. And then when you get to chapter 14, uh, God comes back and says, but while you have these gifts, here's how they need to be exercised. Uh, here's how they need to be used properly. So you have the existence of the gifts in chapter 12, the uh, expiration of those gifts in chapter 13, the uh, exercise of those gifts in chapter 14. But we're in the middle of chapter 12. That's where we kind of stopped uh, in our study last time. When you, hear, when you hear the topic of spiritual gifts, what do you think about? What comes to mind when you hear we're going to talk about spiritual gifts? Miracles. Is there a difference if we talk about spiritual gifts as they're talked about uh, in the New Testament or if we talk about miraculous gifts? Is there any difference between those two concepts? The, the spiritual gifts that were given to the early church were miraculous. They were not natural gifts. There were those who had natural talents, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about spiritual gifts. We're talking about miraculous abilities that God gave to first century Christians. Look in chapter 12, verse 4, just to see that the Bible says that in the first century there are diversities, there are differences of gifts, but they're given by the same Spirit. And we noticed last time that we were together how he emphasizes this this matter of it coming from the same Spirit. You look in chapter 12 and verse 4, these come from the same Spirit. Look in verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit, look in verse 8. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. And then the last three words of verse 8 say the same Spirit. Verse 9 says to another faith by the same Spirit. The last three words you have of verse 9 are the same Spirit. You go to verse 11, but one and the same Spirit. The emphasis in this section is that there were a variety of spiritual miraculous gifts that were given, but they did not come from a variety or a diversity of sources. They all came from the same Spirit. They all came from the same God. So there's the variety of gifts. There's the diversity of gifts, verse 4, but they come from the same Spirit. Verse 5 says that there are differences of ministries. There are different ways in which these gifts can be used to minister and to serve, but they are all used to serve the same Lord. Verse 4, same Spirit. Verse 5, same Lord, that being Jesus. Verse 6, but there are diversities of workings, of efforts, of effects, of activities. These gifts are able to, uh, to affect different ways, but it is the same God who works all in all. Verse 4, you got the Holy Spirit. Verse 5, you got the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 6, you've got God the Father. You have the Godhead pictured here. And so this is not something that the Spirit was doing or giving separate and apart from God the Father and from Jesus the Son, the Lord. The Godhead was operating together in the imparting of these gifts, these abilities, these miraculous abilities to the first century church. There were a variety of these gifts. They are talked about. There are nine of them mentioned. When you get to verse 8, uh, he starts to mention and he lists nine gifts. When you start in verse 8, to one was given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through that same Spirit. Verse 9 says, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings. That's All of these are miraculous. The, the faith that is mentioned in verse 9 is a supernatural faith that was imparted to them. The gifts that are of healings were a miraculous ability they had to heal those who were sick or diseased. Verse 10 mentions those who had the ability to work miracles. It also talks about those who could prophesy. 
those who could discern the spirits, and those who could speak in different kinds of tongues, different languages we talked about last time, and to another the interpretation of those tongues. Nine different gifts talked about here. And we noticed last time that in this listing, he puts the gift of tongues at the end of the list. The Corinthians had elevated the gift of tongues to be the greatest of all the gifts. And so they saw it as something that, that if you had the gift of tongues, you, you, you must be a great Christian to have the premier gift. And everybody wanted to be able to speak in tongues. So when Paul lists them here, he puts it at the end of the list. Go over to verse 29. Uh, verse 28. In verse 28, God has appointed these in the church. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. He lists again some of these miraculous abilities and he puts the gift of tongues at the end of the list. Verse 29, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret. Gives another listing and again puts the idea of speaking in tongues at the end which hopefully was sending, at least at this point, a subtle message to the Corinthian church that maybe this isn't the premier gift. He's going to get more direct um, than just trying to be subtle. Uh, but he is trying to point out to them, go back to verse 4. He is trying to point out to them that there are a diversity of gifts that are being given. And as you get to, as you read through this chapter, He's saying not only are there a diversity of gifts, but there must be a diversity of gifts. What if everybody could speak in tongues? What if that was the only gift that God gave was the ability to speak in tongues? Would there have been some people that could not have been reached? What if there was somebody who didn't have the, did not have the gift of interpretation? When you get to chapter 14, what good does it do to have somebody who has the gift of tongues if they didn't have somebody who had the gift of interpretation? So if, if there was only one gift, what if the only gift that was given was, was the gift of healings? Well, that'd be great for the sick people, but what about the rest of the people who are feeling all right? You haven't done anything, you haven't done anything to impact their lives. God says there are a variety of gifts. There must be a variety of gifts. But the church in Corinth was divided because of these spiritual gifts. They were divided in chapter 1 because of preacheritis that they had going after and following after certain preachers. They were divided in chapter 11 because of their, uh, because of their misuse and, and, uh, of the Lord's Supper and not observing it correctly. Here they are divided again and divided because they are elevating some gifts above others uh, and, and doing that improperly. Look in verse 11, and we're going to continue. Uh, we got down to about verse 11 or 12 last time. So look in verse 11, where it says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things. Who's doing the work? If, if, if you lived in the first century church, and the apostles laid hands on you, which was the only way you could get one of these gifts, by the way, the only way you could get one of these miraculous gifts is if the apostles had laid hands on you. If the apostles had laid hands on you and you were given one of these gifts, who was doing the work? It wasn't you. Verse 11 says, it's the Spirit who's working all these things. Go back up to verse 5 where we saw that all of these activities, it is God who is working all of these things. It's not you. It's not your ability it's not your greatness, it's God's greatness. And so verse 11 says that the Spirit works all of these things and He distributes these gifts, the diversity of gifts, He distributes to each one as He wills. As who wills? As the Spirit wills. As God wills. So God was the one who was choosing which gift to give to certain individuals. So if I didn't get the... If I did not receive the gift of tongues, was that my fault? Was that uh, the apostle's fault who laid his hands on me? If I didn't get the best gift of all, was that because, because my children were misbehaving and God was punished? What? Who made the decision? It's God's choice. 
as to which gift was being imparted. And we're going to talk more about that when we get later in the chapter. Look at verse 12, where he says, For as the body, what is the body? It's the church. How do you know that? How do you know that the body is the church? Because you've heard somebody say that before? How do you know? that? Okay, well, we, somebody says you go over to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 says almost the same thing that Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 says, that the church which is his body, and so Paul used those terms, the body of Christ, the church of Christ, he used those terms interchangeably. We looked at this last time, and, and, uh, but I want us to see it again. You don't even have to go over to Ephesians or Colossians to see that. It's right here in this passage. When you start in verse 12, Paul uses the word body. Um, I didn't count them up today, and I have forgotten how many I counted before, uh, but I'm seeing right now it's probably about 14, 15 times. You can count them as we go through them. Look in verse 12. Verse 12 says, For as the body is, how many? There's one body, and the body is one. There is one body which, which emphasizes, and we'll see it saying that there is one body, which emphasizes its singularity. But here it says that the body is one, which emphasizes its unity. And it has, one, and it has many members. But all the members of that one body, being many, are one. One body. How many times does God have to say that there is the body and the body is one and then twice more in this same verse to say there is one body and those who are members of it are part of the one body. Three times in that verse you've got the word body. Look in verse 13. For by one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Look at verse 14. For in fact the body is not one member but many. Look in verse, the end of verse 15 where it says is it not of the body? Look at the end of verse 16, where it says, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Look in verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were the hearing, where would be the smelling? Look in verse 18. Now, if God has set the members, each one of them, in the body, look in verse 19. If they were all one member, where would the body be? Look in verse 20. Now, indeed, there are many members, but one, how many? One body. Look in verse 22. No, much rather those members of the body, verse 23, and those members of the body, verse 24. But our presentable parts have no need, but God composed the body. Look at verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body, verse 27. Now you are the body. I don't know how many of you were counting, but that's a lot. That's a lot. How many verses have we looked at? We've looked at 16 in that stretch of 16 verses, how many times did he use the word body? Almost 16 times. So on average, almost one time per verse in that stretch of verses, God says, talks about, and uses the word body. What is the body? Verse 27 says, you are the body of Christ. Verse 28 says, God has appointed these in the body. Now he changes words on us. He's used the word body over a dozen times, and then he gets to verse 28 and he says, God has put these in the church. What's the difference between the body of Christ in verse 27 and the church in verse 28? There's no difference. They're exactly the same. And so if the body is the church, if the church is the body, we see that here. We see it in Ephesians and Colossians. Come back to verse 12. For as the body, the church, is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Remember that the church in Corinth is divided is divided specifically in this context over the matter of spiritual gifts. And so Paul is now addressing them and saying, are you seriously going to be divided over these spiritual gifts? Verse 11 says, the spirit of the spiritual gifts. The spirit that gave these gifts, he's the one who decided which gift to give you. And so 
the Spirit gave you these gifts and here you are in the body. And he paints a picture of the church, which the word he uses in verse 28, he paints a picture of the church as a body. How many members does your physical body have? How many members does your physical body have? All right, I got 10 fingers, I got 10 toes, I got one belly button, I got two ears, I got... How many members, how many parts... And that's just the parts on the outside. I, I, I've got two lungs. I've got uh, X number of ribs. I've got how many members? You've got a lot of members to your body, don't you? Are there some members of your body that you didn't even know you had until you reached the age of 50? And all of a sudden you said, well, where did that member come from? Didn't even know I had that one. They start to talk a little bit. They start to, to speak up a little bit. What, Chuck? I said some of your members fall out. What are you talking about, Chuck? <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. That's right. You lost my train of thought, Chuck. Thank you very much. <laughs> the church is presented as the body. Here's a picture. God, Paul says, look at a body. You look at one body, but there are many members to that one body. Now, which member of that body is more important than another? Which member of your body can stand up and say, oh, you get, I'm more important than anybody else. Which member of your body has a right to look at another member of your body and say, hey, we don't need you. Get out of here. We could do without you. Hey, let's do some surgery and get rid of him. We don't want him around here anymore. He's trying to paint a picture of a united body to paint a picture of a united body of Christ. To say, folks, are we seriously going to be divided about this? We are the body, we are the church of Christ. Now, how did you get into that body? What does verse 13 say? Here's, here's Paul. Notice Paul uses the, the, the first person plural pronoun in verse 13 to talk about we and us. He doesn't use the second person. He doesn't say you, 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 you. And he doesn't use the first person, I, 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 singular. And he doesn't use third person, they or he. He says, it's all encompassing, it's we. How did Paul get into the body of Christ? How did, how did Gaius, uh, how, how did uh, Stephanus, how did Chloe, how did some of the members of this household, or members of the church in Corinth, how did they get into that body? Did, did, somebody, uh, did somebody get in differently than another one? Were there some who maybe they had a little bit more money than, than, the, than the poor folks? So, so they had a grander, a more grand, how do you say that? A more illustrious, a mo, how, do you, how can I illustrate? A greater entrance into the church than the poor people did? Well, I got money. Hey, I can pay this. You know, I, I need some royalty here in how I get into it. How did, how did they get into the church? Verse 13. For by one spirit... We, that includes all of them, we were all, could you, does, that, does that include, does that not include anybody? All of us were baptized into how many churches? How many bodies? Oh, there's just one. There's just one body. He uses the word one here to say there's one body. How do I get into if everybody who was in the one body was baptized to get into that body, is there another way to get into that body? If we were all baptized into the body, could there be another way to get into that body? Everybody who's in there got in through the same door. Well, maybe there's another door that, that we don't know about. Oh, there's just one entrance. There's one body and there's one entrance. And it's interesting that in this passage, in order to be a part of the body of Christ, I have to be baptized into it. That same word into is over in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, where it says we are baptized into Christ. How do you get into Christ? Galatians 3, 27 Romans 6, 3, the only two verses that say 
tell us how to get into Christ. We are baptized into Christ. How do I get into the church? I can't get into the church any differently. I'm baptized into the body, into the church. Remember those on the day of Pentecost where it says those that gladly received His word were baptized and there were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls? They were baptized. They were added. What were they added to? you got to drop down to verse 47. The Lord added unto the church daily those who were being saved. How were they saved? As many as gladly received His word were baptized. They were baptized into the body because that's where God put them when they were baptized. Is it possible that I could be saved, that I could get into Christ, that I could get into His body without being baptized? That's, that's not twisting Scripture to fit some doctrine that man has created. That's coming to the Scripture and reading it and saying, what does this verse say? Now notice, for by one Spirit... We're all baptized into one body. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 3 and verse 5? Unless a man be born of water and the Spirit. There were two elements of that one birth in John 3 and verse 5. Guess what elements are mentioned here in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13? Both of them. The Spirit and the water by which someone was baptized. We don't have time to look at it, but you might write in the margin or somewhere in your Bible, you might write next to verse 13. You might write John 3 and verse 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 26, and Titus 3 and verse 5. If you take those four verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, John 3 and verse 5, Ephesians 5 and verse 26 where it says it talks about the washing of water by the word. And, and take Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, the washing of regeneration by the Spirit. You take all four of those verses together and you just lay them out next to each other. Guess what you're going to see? You're going to see that the Bible talks about the Spirit of God being involved in our salvation. Can we be saved apart from the Spirit of God? No. The Bible talks about water being involved in our salvation. All four, uh, all four of those passages talk about it. And the Bible talks about the fact that the only way that I can get into that body in which is salvation is for the Spirit and the water to work together to accomplish that. We're baptized into that body, and it doesn't matter who you are, we all have done that. Verse 14, For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. I've done all the talking. Anybody have any questions or comments to this point? We haven't even got to spiritual gifts very much yet. Anybody uh, got anything to say? You, you know you can raise your hand or shout something out anytime, right? I get carried away and I don't stop sometimes. Verse 15. I gave you a chance. You, you got to jump in. The body is not one member. But many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. What do people see more of you? Do they see your hand more or your foot more? Please don't say it depends on who the person is. You know, and, uh, you know we, I've said before in this class, you can ask a simple question and, and you leave it up to a dirk who figures out, well, you know, maybe he sees my foot more. You know, figure, you, no, what do they see more? Your hand or your foot? Which member of your body has more prominence, has, has more glory? Which member of your body has more glory, your hand or your foot? Do you walk around with your hand in a, in a sock, in a shoe all day? Is your hand hidden all day? No, you hide your foot. And thankfully so, right? Some of us don't have very good looking feet. But uh, so if the foot should say, boy, I'm not a hand, you know, not, nobody gets to see me. So if the, if the foot should say to the hand, well... I'm not a hand, so I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? I, I, I'm just not as glorious. I'm not as, as highly uh, honored as the hand, so I'm just not as important. Are your feet important? Mm -hmm. 
If the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I'm just not of the body. I'm on the side. I'm not even on the front of the body. God stuck me over on the side. He's, the eye's out there in the front. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body, here he changes the perspective. He was looking at it from member to member. Now he says, if the whole body, you look at the whole body. If the whole body were an eye, what would your body look like if the whole thing were an eye? You seen Monsters, Inc.? You seen Mike Wazowski? Is that the guy's name? That'd be pretty close to what your body would look like if your body was an eye. If the whole body were an eye, uh, where would the hearing be? Well, I'm not an eye. I'm not very important. Okay. If your whole body was an eye, how well would you be hearing? If the whole, if the whole body were hearing, where would be the smelling? What's the point? Paul's not talking about, you know, he's not telling you to appreciate your feet and your ears and every part of your body, although that's implied here. Remember Paul's point here, he's talking about the church. Is there anybody in the church who could say, well, I'm not a, I'm not a this, or I'm not him, or I'm not her, and, and they're more prominent, so I'm just not as important? No. Because, what does verse 18 say? But now God... Here's what we might snipe at each other and we might say all of these things under, well, you know, he's more important than I. Well, I'm just not very important. Nobody ever asked me to do anything. But God has done what? God has set the members, each and every one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Does that remind you of verse 11? That the Spirit delivered, gave out these a diversity of gifts, the Spirit delivered them to each one individually as the Spirit willed. That's how He gave out the gifts. Now in verse 18, God has set within the body, within the church, every one of the members as it pleased Him. Look down at verse 24. You see the same but God in verse 24, the middle of the verse. But God composed the body. Who created the church? Who's in charge of the church? Verse 18, God has set the members in the church. Verse 24, God composed the church. Look at verse 28. God has appointed the works in the church. When any of us, when any of us begin to think that the church revolves around us, when any of us begin to think, well, the church isn't doing anything for me. Or when any of us begin to think, you know what, well, that church, they, they, they couldn't survive without me down there. What does the Bible say? You're just one part. And just like your physical body functions best with all of the parts together, the spiritual body of the church functions best with all of the parts in their place where God put them and functioning in the way that God directed them to do. What if the foot should start acting like a hand? Well, I don't want to be a foot anymore. I'm going to start acting like a hand. Is that really what your body needs? Does your body need another hand? I mean, I know you say when you got all these kids, boy, if I just had another hand, you know, then I could spank three kids at once and not just two at once. You know, we, we wish we had more hands. Do you really want your foot to become, do you want your ear to become an eye? Well, you know, if I only had eyes in the side of my head, not just the back of my head, but God has put you in the church. Remember Acts 2 and verse 47, God added them to the church. God put you there. And it's God who has composed the body as it pleased him. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? If your body was just one big old member, how would that body function? It couldn't. But now indeed, there are many members, yet there's only one body. Oh, there's so much I want to say there, we've got to keep going. And if the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you, no, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker. 
Do you have any parts of your physical body that seem to be weaker? Maybe getting weaker as the years go by? Or maybe some parts of your body that just are, they're just weak. Which finger on your hand is the weakest? It's the little one, right? Your little finger is the weakest finger on your hand, right? Wrong. It's not. Your ring finger is the weakest finger on your Well, good. Let's get rid of that. You know, I don't, I don't need that and be better off. Then I won't have to get married if I don't have a ring finger. So I, I can get rid of that. How's your hand going to function without your ring finger? Could you, learn to, could you learn to function without it? Sure you could. Is it a lot easier if you've got it? How important is your little toe? How important? Your little, the little one. The one that's stuck out there on the end. How important is that little thing? You know, why do you need that little toe? You need that little toe to find the bar stool in the middle of the night when you're walking through the house. You wouldn't know it was in front of you if it hadn't been for your little toe that found it. Just get rid of that thing. It, it, it keeps finding every piece of furniture in the house. If I could get rid of that toe, then, then I wouldn't hurt so bad when I stub it. Is that little toe important? Uh-huh. It, we have the weaker members of our body. What does the Bible say about those weaker members of the spiritual body? They are necessary. When God tells the church to encourage one another, what if there wasn't anybody who needed encouragement? When God tells the church to build each other up, what if there wasn't anybody who needed to be built up? Boy, everybody's doing perfect. Everybody's doing great. There's nobody who needs anything. Those weaker members are necessary. Look in verse, uh, where did we leave off? Verse 23. And those members of the body which we think are less honorable... On these we bestow greater honor, and our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts, they don't have any need. When the Bible talks about the weaker members, the less honorable members, and the unpresentable members, I think it's interesting that God even put into the Bible that He knew there were going to be weaker members, less honorable members, and those members who were perhaps... Well, they're just kind of the unpresentable ones. You know, they're, they're the ones that we're a little embarrassed to have around sometimes. And God puts all three of those right here in the Bible to say they are, they are not only going to be in the church, you need them in the church. So what about this guy who got a spiritual gift and it wasn't the gift of tongues? What about this guy and, and, and his spiritual gift was one of those that we might consider less honorable. Boy, he didn't get a good one. I wonder what sin he's been committing that God didn't trust him with a good gift. The Bible says God makes those choices, but even those who are less honorable and unpresentable are composed by God in the body, verse 24, because he has given greater honor to that part which lacks it that there should be no division or schism in the body. God has put this body together and he's put it together in such a way that he didn't create the division. So when there is division in the body, where did it come from? It came from man. You look out into, uh, you look out into the, the church around the world. Is there division in the church around the world? Who caused that? God or man? You suppose God is pleased with it? That there is division? No. That's not the way God put it together. Look at verse 26. Well, verse 28, 25 says that there should be no division or schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care. The same, should you care for the presentable parts as much as you care for the unpresentable parts? 
Should you care for the less honorable parts as much as you care for the honorable parts, for the weaker parts as much as you do for the stronger parts? It's interesting that the Bible uses the word same in that verse, that we should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. What happens when your one member finds that bar stool in the middle of the night? What happens when your little toe is hurting? Does the rest of your body say, shake it off? Does the rest of your body not notice? It gets a lot of attention, doesn't it? You sit down and you start caressing, oh, don't hurt your little toe. I mean, you start giving that little toe all the attention in the world. Guess what? It wasn't getting any attention 10 minutes ago. And now it's the center of your body's universe. When one member suffers, everybody got. What about the body of Christ? When one member suffers, oh, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps, would you? Get over yourself, would you? You know, it's been long enough already. You should be beyond that already. No, the rest of us suffer with it. But when, all, when one member rejoices, is honored, everybody else rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ. Inside of that body you, you have diversity. There are, you are members individually, but remember that it is God who has put you together. Who does the church belong to? It doesn't belong to us. We're, we are just fortunate to be a part of it. We are just blessed that God has found a place for us in His body. May we learn to give glory and honor to the one who died for us that we could become a part of this body. And may we find a place in the body of Christ where we can be used not for our good, but for His good. And to remember that we're all individually uh, diverse in, within the body of Christ. We don't have these spiritual gifts today. We talked about that two weeks ago. We'll talk about it again next week. But the reality is that we need each other. Romans chapter 12 verse 5 says that we are members of one another. We belong to each other. Does your, I know the bell's rung. Give me just a second. Does your arm belong to your foot? Does your hand belong to your finger? Do, do, do your body parts belong to each other? In the body of Christ, we are members of one another. We belong to each other. But when it came to these spiritual gifts, they were only for a limited time. And God said, I've got something even greater for the church than these miraculous abilities I've given. And we'll talk about that next week. Thanks so much for your good attention tonight.